much. Uh, I'm uh, very, very pleased to be here this afternoon uh, with uh, you because I think it's all about the next generation, about the people who are now uh, getting ready to go into uh, the work life, international work life, and the motivation that you bring to the table, and also the aspirations and the intentions that you bring uh, to the table. And I will um, share with you a little bit uh, my story and our story um, of uh, how that developed over the years and now almost decades, getting older. Uh, but it gets you know, even better over time, so don't worry about that. I will um, actually talk about these different um, names up here at our foundation and Social Impact International as part of um, our, my, my personal story. Um, so that's the first part of the um, talk that I have prepared uh, for you. And then the second one is actually what we um, focus on right now and what change we want to actually do over the next uh, few years and a couple of decades. And uh, I hope that I see a lot of uh, interesting thoughts uh, in the first half of our conversation or, or discussion such that we can actually have a good uh, debate and discussion in the second half of this session. So um, you have detected probably a slight accent, which is true. <laughs> and uh, so I grew up in Innsbruck, which is in Austria, as the skiing capital, or <laughs> one of the skiing capitals in the world. And I was uh, quite incompatible with my dad at the time, which prompted me to look for opportunities to leave Innsbruck. Uh, and I applied for a scholarship, uh, which was uh, AFS, American Field Service, which allows non-US uh, students, high school students, to come to the US and spend an, a, a year with the family and go to, um, go to school here. And they chose, miraculously, Hawaii for me. I had nothing to do with this, because you cannot say, I want to actually go to Alaska or Nebraska or somewhere else. So the algorithm that mapped students to, to families obviously worked well. And the most, you know, supposedly I studied there for a year, which was great. I studied a lot of surfing and Hawaiian. And I met Lisa, uh, my wife, there in 1974, 75, so almost 40 years ago. And so, um, I, unfortunately, I had to go back to uh, Austria, to Vienna. And uh, I decided to study computer science in Vienna, 1975. So the first year, we actually had to do coding with uh, punch cards. But then we got Apple IIs. And, uh, and then you know I, I, I stayed in Vienna, and we had our kids, which are now here. You see here as young adults, um, not back then, uh, in Vienna. And um, you know societies are, are interesting, because societies either enable you to self-actualize right, uh, in what you really want to do, or they don't. And at that point in time, the Austrian society was quite conservative towards non-Austrian professional women, which my wife is one of those. And so she said, well, they make it very hard you know, to work there and be entrepreneurial. And therefore, she said, let's go to the US. And I said, OK, if we go to the US, let's go to Silicon Valley, because that's uh, where I could actually self-actualize my dreams about implementing the coolest technology on the planet. Uh, so I have a PhD in, in, in distributed systems, and I'll share with you a little bit which ones I was involved in. But that was really just the precursor um, to moving on yet one more time, and that's to Big Sur, which is down south a little bit. Uh, and the reason we moved to Big Sur, which, which will become clearer to you in the first uh, 45 minutes, is because we changed the, imp the impact that our lives, um, um, that we want to have with our lives. And you want to go to uh, an area that actually inspires you to do what you really want to do. And Big Sur is a very inspiring landscape uh, with, the, with a lot of positive energy, also challenging energy once in a while, uh, that enables us to reflect on the purpose of our lives and what we want to do with that. You see here our beach property and the mountain property which I just left, one of the trees, which is a big inspiration for me. You know, when, when we had uh, an arborist actually go and check out our redwood trees, they said, uh, he said, I said, how old is this tree? He said, well, between 800 and 1300 years old. 
And uh, he said, do you want me to drill a hole so that so you know exactly how old? I said, no, 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 it's roughly a thousand years. That's good enough. And so, so in, in that, you know, I think, I think it's important um, uh, the location that you choose to, to hang out with as well as the, the work that you do. And I moved also from big companies uh, all the way from the university in, in Vienna to HB, which brought us over here to Silicon Valley, uh, to then say, oh, let's act digital, nobody remembers here anymore, it's part of HB now, um, to the startup scene. And um, I was very lucky to have been able to work with uh, Steve Jobs at a company called Next in the uh, 90s. And I was responsible for, I'm very grateful to see all these system pens working on all these laptops here, because I developed uh, OpenStep, which was the precursor of System 10, which is running on all of your uh, on all of your iPhones, iPads, and uh, and Mac Airs, and what have you. And I share a little bit of my uh, of a couple of observations, uh, you know, that that I have with respect to leadership and conscious leadership um, in a minute about this part of my life. And then I worked uh, for Rightpoint Data Mine, which we sold to Epiphany in the late '90s for 400 million dollars. And my masterpiece, so to speak, where I really combined what I learned from Steve Jobs about highly effective teams to really building the biggest transaction platform on the planet is a business-to-business e-commerce company called Ariba, which we went public with in 1998, and which was an independent company until, uh, 2000, until this year, actually, where it was bought uh, by SAP for about $4.5 billion. So I'll tell you a story about SAP, because I tried to do a... I tried to do a partnership, a business partnership with SAP in 1997, and then Dr. Hasso Plattner, the then CEO of uh, SAP, was here in the Valley, and uh, Keith Kroc, my CEO, and I went over and said, hey, do we want to collaborate and partner? In the end, you know, <laughs> being typical German, he said, look, guys, I built the car, meaning SAP, you can build the uh, radio in my car, and I play the music on my radio. <laughs> And I said, well, that doesn't look like a great partnership. You know, partnerships go like partners, hello, you know. And, uh, and so um, they, in the end, <laughs> bought Ariba for four and a half billion. He could have had it a little cheaper, you know, about uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago. In any case, you know, when you create a, a 10 to $20 billion company and you own one and a half percent of the company, you don't need to have a PhD in, in, in mathematics to understand that that actually made us quite rich. Not only our shareholders, but us, right? Which we didn't really plan. <laughs> so, I mean, I planned to go to Silicon Valley to have uh, fun and, and implement the best products on the planet, which I did. And so here I was with 45 and, uh, and achieved that. Which, which is interesting, right? Because it, uh, it poses a couple of fundamental questions about meaning of life and meaning of wealth and how capitalism works and how philanthropy works. And um, and fortunately for me, Lisa, my wife, and I, we uh, were on the same page on that one. We didn't confuse our genius being causally related to our wealth, uh, and therefore we actually consider our wealth to be a gift that we are responsible to steward towards positive impact. And so what that did to us is we actually asked, you know, once you have wealth, you have wealth advisors, and the wealth advisors, they want a lot of money and to do their work. And we say, well, we want to do something good with our wealth. So back then, that was actually not an, a, a question that was commonly you know, asked of these wealth advisors because they just say, normally, you want to maximize your financial return such that then you can maximize your fan giving capacity, which is sort of absurd at best uh, because especially if your money actually counters what you care about in your values and in your life, right? And so um, in the last 10 years, you know, we have uh, aligned our lives with uh, positive impact. And anything that we do, we strive towards actually making sure that it's in alignment with our values, which I will share in a minute, and what we believe in. So before we go into that, I wanted to um, actually share a couple of uh, leadership lessons. And since I worked for Steve, and he was a big, uh, I was a big fan of his, 
I just want to point out a couple of things that made him successful. He was also a very, a very um, driven person and, uh, and very difficult at times, right? But, uh, but for instance, uh, one thing that inspires me is when, when behind leapfrog. So we are at the state of humanity and the financial systems that is not the best of states. And I will make the argument to you tonight, this afternoon, that if we don't change course, right, that, um, uh, that, that the, the bad things of how wealth is deployed are actually going to become bigger, not smaller. And so when behind leapfrog, so I'm working very diligently together with a lot of friends around the globe in changing the financial systems such that they will be realigned uh, to have a positive impact and not these god-awful externalities as the uh, macroeconomists conveniently call them that might burn us up <laughs> because just because nobody can figure out how to make them internalities and we don't accept that as a premise. Uh, also sciences and humanities, I was always intrigued. I'm an engineer by trade, right? And Steve is not an engineer. He treated us engineers quite well and but the combination of talents really made the magic happen, not just one or the other. And um, another lesson that I've learned and observed and practiced myself is that successful leaders actually go back and forth between seemingly incompatible or opposed types of uh, attributes. And, but they know how to choose the one that's right for wherever they are. And um, just uh, you know, organized and spontaneous. If you're always organized, always have a plan, then you're a manager, an administrator, you're not a leader, right? If you're always spontaneous, well, then by accident, maybe a few good things will happen, but it uh, will be a real accident. And similarly, you know, we can explore these themes, so I key them up uh, later if appropriate or not. I think it's very, very important to figure out um, how you can uh, lead and serve at the same time or in different times. And I share a few um, efforts that I'm involved in where I put, uh, where I'm a real servant to everybody else. And sometimes I get to lead and it's, it's more fluid these days. It's not uh, line management anymore. And I share um, a couple of organizations that I get to work with that really do that on a global level now. And, uh, but I, I'm actually uh, most interested in impact leaders, conscious leaders, in leaders uh, that usually are not the leaders of, they're not leaders of the current um, multinationals because the current leadership to be successful on that level requires sometimes a lack of authenticity, a lack of integrity, a lack of awareness and consciousness because you do things that you know you should not do. And so a radical commitment to authenticity and, and awareness and uh, transparency, I think, is the call of the day and in all aspects of life, I think. And without this, you know, we, I'm okay if society decides fully aware and fully conscious and to, to choose something in a transparent way if, as long as you know it, right? But if you don't know about it, that's not okay anymore. And so you will be challenged, right, in your careers over the next few decades in um, really leading an authentic, an authentic life and leading with integrity and awareness and the, the right level of consciousness. So, so we talked, I talked a lot about, a little bit about our entrepreneurial approach and the leverage that I like to see in everything that we do. And I want to now give you a little bit more motivation about why I do and we do things that we do and they have to do with our values and the challenge of actually, for humanity that is, the challenge of living within the capacity constraints of the limit, limited planet, right? And, um, and so holistic sustainability. And so my values I define as uh, integrity, courage, and joy. And I take integrity serious to the point where it actually, I want to live a life that's in utmost, in utmost um, alignment with the purpose of my life. That's how I define integrity. And so it's not, not lying or something very superficial, but once you know, and I share the purpose of my life in a second, you know, then you actually have to really work on that. And the more intentional you are about this, the more magic happens 
and that that really is not credited to you as an ego or as a as a skin encapsulated body but really to your soul right to who you really are not just the body or the mind but the soul and that we have the courage to choose at the point when you have actually can make choices to choose the right things and if you just catch that point before you make a choice you will know you will know what the right choice is just start to listen to that in your career choices in, in how you choose to live your life and how you choose to live uh, your 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 uh, time and important since we are here at least temporarily you know might as well enjoy the body and your mind <laughs> while you have it and so i'm fully signed up for that as well so but i want to talk about the the more global themes of uh, what also inspire me so we talked about uh, we as human beings why we need to do what we need to do and i hope i convinced you that uh, not only do i have deep desire but the conviction and the intention to live a high integrity life that actually makes a positive impact now when you also combine that now with understanding where the globe and humanity is really traveling towards then the, the defining challenge is to get to of sustainable development is that everybody on the planet uh, is able to lead a fulfilling life um, without degradation of the resources and capitalism arguably is okay on the first part not totally i make that argument too but really the side effects of capitalism sometimes really have a very bad side effect on the planet and the resources of the planet so once you start so you <laughs> so you need to study that because as soon as you know you need to study the system such that you know how to change it right and so for those of you who study MB mba you, you will learn how the system works and then if you decide to actually change it to the better great then you can do it you know about the world population resource constraints and something that's called modern portfolio theory uh that's clearly wrong yet everybody pretends as if it's as if that's how how, how investments should be done and um and so the perpetuation of clearly wrong assumptions is something that i actually don't really understand seemingly intelligent people right they pretend and and act as if it doesn't happen so just to give an example of modern portfolio theory how it works is they say everything actually happens in a perfect market there's no perfect market they say that we're all rational investors i mean i've not met one yet i'm not one either <laughs> and so we all have our biases right they say don't worry about the externalities it's okay it's it doesn't really matter right and if we mess up the planet and mess up the societies don't worry so those are things that we actually need to fix and the financial system right now i'm i told you i've built really large distributed systems with resiliency built into it like i was inspired by nature by recursive algorithms how they how they seem to apply in nature by redundancy by replica by replication and so the Ariba system, even if some nodes go down, it will not stop. The financial system right now is built to maximum efficiency, which for you who, who understand systems and think systemically, is not a good uh, position to be in. You need to build the resiliency into that system again. Just like biodiversity, right? And, and nature uh, teaches us how to do that. <clears throat> so we're in, in a new era, and some call that Anthropocene. And it follows the Holocene. And uh, the Holocene is th those 10,000 years when humanity really thrived to the point where we are now. A stable climate, resources, up to 1.2 billion people only 150 years ago, right? And now, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, arguably, humanity is in a position to actually have a significant impact on the biosphere on a planetary scale. And that I submit requires different ways of thinking, right? And, and for me, people who think that a system that was invented 150 years ago when we did have 1.2 billion people on the planet and seemingly un unlimited resources, if they think it doesn't have to be reinvented for an order of magnitude more people with, with limited resources, I don't understand that position. I am very inspired by the Global Footprint Network done in Oakland over there that have a very, very scientific and, and profound way of, uh, of, of analyzing how much resources, how many resources we actually use. And today, um, humanity uses about 50% more resources than is regener regenerated by uh, the natural systems. 
So we need to change that trajectory. And, um, and I think that investment and, and money and capitalism is one big way of uh, doing that. So, um, so based on all these trends and my conviction, here is my purpose for my life, right? Uh, and it's like three main portions. One is to enable social entrepreneurs to be able to scale sustainably and with bigger impact. And you are interested in social entrepreneurs, and so we call them impact entrepreneurs or whatever you call them. But really, the main um, item there being that they have a social mission and or environmental mission that's positive, right? And the corollary to that is that uh, I am helping capitalism, market economies, and philanthropy to actually support the right level of investments to the right level of entrepreneurs. And that's some, that, re re that does require a blend a lot of times. And, and it requires an explicit measurement of the impact that we have, the positive impact. Otherwise, how, do you, how can you prove that you have a positive impact? And uh, inspire others to lead a purposeful and values-driven life. So, so that was the first part. So the second part of my talk is now what I'm doing right now to actually uh, actualize the purpose <laughs> of my life, right? Since I know what it is, I better get going on that. And I'm going to talk about uh, three items here. One is uh, our foundation, KL Felicitas Foundation, and then uh, capacity building for entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and uh, investors. And the last piece about the modern global networks that all need to be in place in order to actually accomplish what I set out to do um, uh, with, uh, with my life. So uh, Lisa and I co-founded our foundation in 2001, and it, not surprisingly, <laughs> is is uh, there in order to enable, again, social entrepreneurs to go to scale sustainably, right? And, um, and the second piece now that developed over the last 10 years is what we call impact investing approach. So most foundations operate bifurcated. They give out grants on one side and they invest their endowment on the other side. And usually these two sides don't talk to each other. As a matter of fact, most foundations are run such that they maximize their financial return in order to actually give out more grants. And superficially, that seems like it makes a lot of sense, but if you dig in a little bit and you actually see what uh, the endowments are uh, invested in, then a lot of times the investments actually counter what the foundation is set up to do. Um, so I get to talk to a lot of uh, great uh, foundations, and especially the, um, the green foundations in the US they are now, for the first time, actually starting to say that they need to um, divest from the negative implications of climate change. And um, to give you a sense of what that really means and how people think about this is, first thing is always negative. They want to avoid the worst offenders. They want to avoid the, the bad things, right? And that's the, and th there, there is actually um, history in the U.S. about this. Um, you know, avoiding the sin stocks. And you could tell your, your investment manager to avoid alcohol and prostitution and guns and what have you, right? And so the 15 worst offenders in climate change, everybody pretty much, except for the 15 offenders, agree that they are the 15 worst offenders. And so it's fairly simple to say, okay, I'm not gonna invest in those, right? But then if you actually think about, um, well, that's just a negative avoidance as opposed to a positive contribution to alleviating the issue in the first place. So us impact investors are not, are not happy to just avoid the bad things, but we want to use our capital and our investments to make a positive contribution. And so in that particular instance, you know, it would mean that you would have to um, divest yourself from all carbon you know, investments and then reinvest in renewable energies, in carbon offsets, in biodiversity, and things of that nature, right? Uh, and we have done that over the last uh, 10 years. And that's called impact investing. And, uh, and so impact investing is actually a small movement, uh, but it's small <laughs> in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I talk about that a little bit more. It's small because the most capital is actually in pension funds. And the most pension funds are in the US. There's about $38 trillion in pension funds. And so if we don't really uh, change the pension funds and our you know, our two trillion that we have in high net worth individuals and back offices are just gonna be a little rounding error on the big uh, capital. And so I will have to 
prove to you that we're on track and changing that uh, later um, a little bit. So we invest, to give you a sense, in health point services, for instance, EHP, which provides health services to the rural population in India. We invest in Beartooth Capital, which combines uh, conservation of land to limited, uh, limited um, uh, development of land, not one or the other. It's a com combined land use uh, plan where, which we think is appropriate. And we made actually pretty good uh, financial results with this strategy. Uh, we, so one thing that people ask me that you can also do is where do you put your cash, right? Everybody has cash. And, uh, you know, and we demand transparency of our cash. I don't, want to, I don't want my cash to go to the weapons industry. I don't want my cash to finance the wars. I actually want my cash to go to the local community. I want my cash to be positive in supporting entrepreneurs in the local community. So when you, if that's your values, right, then you need to say, well, I want to insist on that. Because otherwise your money works against your values, which, which would not be a good thing. And so you do a little bit of research. If you actually don't believe that, um, that the dirty coal is, a, is, is, is something that should be supported anymore, and you understand that Bank of America is actually financing most of the loans of the dirty coal industry in, uh, in the US, well, then you probably won't give uh, your money cash to Bank of America, but somewhere else. Good. Where? Well, <laughs> the good news is there's lots of great opportunities in the US and all over the world you know, to do that in Southern Bank Corp and New Resource Bank here in San Francisco. They are very transparent, RSF Social Finance, about what they do with your cash. So the good news is we can all do that, and we don't have to give the money to the banks that don't, uh, that don't provide that transparency. What about you know, commodities? in real assets. It's a very, very, very um, important asset class for impact investors because you're very close to the assets if you invest in real assets, right? But the, the bad news is that all extractive technologies, mining, you know, is not really good, not only to the miners, but not also not good to the land because they usually leave a lot of chemicals in the land and they're not held accountable for cleanup. And therefore, oops, we cannot do that either. So we don't invest in oil, we don't invest in extractives and gold, uh, but fortunately, you know, we can invest in all these great investment um, uh, opportunities that do biodiversity, mixed land use, uh, renewable timber, right? I mean, at this day and age, you should get superior returns for renewable timber, yet sometimes you don't, and it's a systemic issue because cutting down trees and not replacing them is actually counted positive as a GDP factor, right? And so nations who cut down trees and don't replace them can boost their supposed economic progress. You know, they call it that way, yet it's actually destroying everything else. So we need to not only do impact investing, but we need to reinvent the way that it's counted and need to go to the, you know, um, our Bhutanese friends, they have the, uh, the National Happiness Index and things of that nature, which is good. Um, we do a lot of, in, a lot, we do a, do a dozen or so direct uh, investments in small companies. So recently uh, we got intrigued by, um, by, uh, by, by, by companies that actually work with uh, creating, um, creating movements, right? Uh, global movements. Uh, and so we investigated uh, change.org and purpose.com and we decided to invest in purpose.com. And so we learn how to do that because ultimately we want to make impact investing a worldwide movement that goes all the way from institutional capital to the retail capital that you, that you have in, in this room. And so to finish up the story about our foundation, we are pretty much 100% into impact, positive impact, about 93% right now. And, um, and the question always is, do you need to take a financial haircut or not? And I'm glad to get one more X today. And, and we just proved because we published our, our report and you can download it from our website if you're interested that uh, we actually have very competitive financial returns in all asset classes uh, compared to non-impact investments, which is a first in the industry and which has to be proven in order to motivate uh, more money to come in. Of course, we care about the impact as well, which uh, we might get into um, you know, in our Q&A session discussion, uh, but let me move on to a couple of other things that we do. And that's capacity building. So, um, you know, the fledgling social entrepreneurs who are not trained as entrepreneurs, who don't really know how to read a P&L, who don't really know how to manage towards cash flow break even, who don't really have that know-how, 
they need, um, and they don't have access to business schools like this, they need what's called capacity building in the not-for-profit sector, peer-to-peer -peer learning, mentoring, and, and we have, um, with our grant capital, actually through Social Impact International, uh, worked with uh, quite a few uh, incubators. It's like an incubator of incubators, right? Um, where we train uh, dozens of entrepreneurs uh, in, cr in creating impactful enterprises, and some of them then we actually uh, invest in or make sure that other people invest in them. And particularly, the first one that I, that I incubated was Dasra Social Impact in India. And there we do about um, 30 entrepreneurs per year and all the way. There's actually a couple of, uh, of ex-Stanford uh, people came through two years ago, like um, uh, the, the, baby, the baby warmer. What's it called now? <laughs> Embrace. Embrace came through that. Yeah, Husk Power Systems came through that. BioLite, which we invested, came through that. So quite, you know, quite innovative uh, social enterprises, right? That, uh, that make a big splash and really make a big impact. And uh, Lisa, Lisa is doing the Hawaiian Investment Ready Program, uh, which is focused on indigenous Hawaiian entrepreneurs. She's part Hawaiian. Her great-great-grandmother was 100% Hawaiian. And uh, for culturally appropriate enterprises, right? Uh, that, that actually do land use the way that Hawaiians did it, that, that uh, recultivate the language and the culture uh, that uh, we, 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 we collaborate with, uh, with uh, local food production for local food consumption, fish ponds that are revitalized, things of that nature. And um, so the last piece that I want to really key up a little bit uh, is global networks. And, uh, you know, I'm very intrigued with respect to where we are as humanity vis-a-vis -vis technology and what, en what enablement we have across humanity and, and how important that is in conjunction with regional get-togethers, physical, physical get-togethers, and really comparing notes on, a, on, on, on an eye-to-eye -eye level. And so I think the magic is really at, at this stage the combination where you have um, physical instantiations of people getting collaborating together, together with a backbone that's global that does either mem member management, uh, mem member management platform, or transaction platform, or due diligence platform. And one of the uh, boards that I'm on is the Impact Hub. There's multiple hubs in the Bay Area. You might be familiar with the one in San Francisco. There's one coming up in uh, Oakland, and there's about uh, 50 hubs all over the world, going to 200 hubs. It's a beautiful movement, and uh, and we have a very powerful membership platform behind that that enables the members who participate in these hubs to collaborate on different, on different levels. I think similarly, um, you know, Tonic is the global network of active impact investors, people like ourselves, where we uh, collaborate globally uh, to channel money um, into these social enterprises. And so it's about <coughs> six, 60, 60 investors across the whole globe uh, including India, South Korea, Brazil now, uh, Hong Kong, Australia, and, and uh, the majority is still being NATO-ish in uh, North Atlantic in, in, in the U.S. and in, in Europe, but moving, moving, moving rapidly again into a global movement. And by practicing radical transparency on the due diligence sharing, we actually turn the classical angel model upside down where we are able to syndicate capital from all over the world to all over the world. And, um, and so I'm very, very um, uh, jazzed up about, uh, about that one. And that then uh, inspired me to create a subset of, uh, of asset owners, and, and, and I call it the 100% Impact Network, where it's asset owners who have intentionally committed 100% of their assets to positive impact. Now, that's an interesting, an, an interesting uh, proposition because it's, it goes, it takes away the safety net of high net worth individuals where you say, oh, hey, you know, if you have 100 million and you carve out 20, who cares, right? You're not really putting everything on the line. And so in this instance, I have 27 collaborators and all the way from 5 million to $500 million um, portfolios, and they go 100% in. And uh, so interesting questions arise with respect to, let's say, an art collection, right? If you have 500 million, Maybe you have some art uh, lying around and, and are a collector. And some people ask me, what about, Charlie, is that impactful? I say, 
Well, think about it. If you think that art is a beautiful expression of humanity and you support young artists to express themselves uh, and buy their work and then, you know, in order to do that, of course it's impactful. If, on the other hand, you buy the latest Cezanne and put it into your safe and then flip it around at the maximum financial profit, you know, I don't have to tell you that that's not very impactful, right? And so you see seemingly difficult questions, actually, if you reflect on, on what they really mean for you, are not that difficult uh, to handle. And that is my Trojan horse um, now uh, in order to really change the industry, because in that, you know, we have about $2.7 billion aggregated amongst all of our sales. And that enables us, again, it's not 38 trillion, but it's getting to the point where, you know, people start taking um, notice of us. And uh, if, in the next, if in the next two to three to four years, we can actually prove that we can build these multi hundred million dollar portfolios with impact and financial return, that then will give us the uh, conviction to regulate the big endowments and the pension plans to say, no, you can't do that because we have proven it. Here's how, how you do it, right? There's also um, a, a small movement uh, emerging to democratize impact investing. You might ask how you participate in impact investing. It's difficult for you to do that because you don't have that many assets. Yet, you know, I told you about cash. I told you about RSF social finance. There's more crowdfunding platforms coming online. We know the um, you know all the all the people who are working on that, so you can finance individual projects like over Solar Mosaic, for instance, you know, uh, or Crowdfunder, which Tom Tonic is partnering with, and there it's beautiful. You can invest a thousand dollars, right, and uh, or less, a hundred dollars, you know, to participate in as an impact investor on that level. It's not robust yet. I mean, actually, the the Jobs Act three was just passed now, and it will be implemented in April. But you know, U.S. being in the U.S. is Tons of people working on, on, on enabling these platforms. And we need new products, right? Uh, because it's not acceptable you know, for us to invest in the old extractive technologies. How can we create products that actually, you know, um, where, where you treat the people in the planet uh, really? Um, did you have a question? Yeah. 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 I'm, all, yeah. I'm almost done, and then we go into questions. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, so the foundations actually, let me respond in, in, in two parts. The foundations in the U.S., you know, are obligated to, so they're not tax, tax shelters in the U.S. In Europe, uh, partially they are, depending on which country you're in. But in, in the U.S., you cannot really uh, use the money unless you give it to charities. So that's by law. You cannot, you know, it, you, if you manage it yourself, you can pay yourself a decent salary, and they're checking that, right? Um, but that's about it. And so the U.S. law says that 5% of the, of the foundation needs to be paid out per year, either in grants or in what's called uh, program-related investments, which are below market investments. And the rest is not regulated. And the rest is what we talk about should move into impact investing. Then the 95%, because right now the foundations, look at it, you know, a foundation gets the benefit of a tax, gets a tax benefit uh, from society, right? So it doesn't pay any taxes in, back into society in order to have a mission, right? In order to implement the mission. If the mission is, um, you know, to help, uh, the, um, to help the planet become more green and you invest in dirty coal, that doesn't make sense, right? And so I think that the regulatory framework over time will actually not, will actually not allow the, the, the corpus of the foundations to knowingly mess up the mission of the foundation, which is one step towards then making it more positively. You know, when I talk, when I talk to um, hedge fund managers, which I do now, um, you know, I make the case of uh, you should be in, in, in impact investing in order to hedge against the next downturn because a lot of our investments actually didn't go down in 2008, 2009 because they were not correlated with the system, right? And they understand that. Uh, but it's not sticky unless you actually change the energy around and say, instead of trying to avoid a negative downturn, you want to invest in the positive self-expression of the planet healing itself, right, through, through, the, through, through money. 
And that, so, so about 5% of the hedge fund managers actually do understand that. And they come up usually, and then, and then it's maybe one in the end that, that's, that, that's still talking to me. And I say, in order to do that, you need to transform your sales. But that's an <laughs> elevated you know, argument that most hedge fund managers cannot follow yet. Uh, <laughs> but they will, right? I mean, so, you know, everybody is at where, where they're at. So, um, and then, so the, the 100 percenters actually are 35 percent foundations and 65 percent uh, back offices that don't have a foundation. So, so I, <laughs> I eased into, in, into that uh, through various ways. Okay, so um, we talked about this a little bit. So we're working on the new, the new principles of investments, right, uh, of investing for um, this for this age of humanity. And it's really taking responsibility again for your investments, right? Not day trading, not delegating that and saying, oh, this is really not part of my problem. If you, if, you, know, if you have a 401k, we're working on getting 401k plans so that you can choose your impact investments as part of your 401k plans. As you have a life insurance, we're working on with the life insurance industry such that they can actually offer the life insurance with impact investments. Uh, so you see that we are working on all these things to, so that we can actually change the current non-sustainable way that the, that, that the system works to a sustainable way. Um, and, and so the impact industry is emerging and ultimately we can drop impact from the investment side again because all investments should be positive, not be negative, right? And, uh, and I think that that's a good uh, vision to have and should not be too far off. Um, and with this, uh, you know, I want to conclude the talk so that we have 40 minutes of, uh, of, of conversation with a hero of mine, and that's Bucky, and he is a big system thinker, and, uh, and of course I believe in that, and so are you, otherwise you would not sit in this class. And uh, last but not least, I really want to leave you with um, something that really brings home the responsibility that we all have. And uh, your life ultimately is the expression of who you really are. And you cannot pretend it's not because you make your choices. And so on that level, I hope I um, wish you the best for the choices that you make to really realize a life uh, that you are proud of in the end. And with this, um, I want to just conclude my remarks and go into a discussion here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. People can't understand the questions, right? Or should I, should I repeat it? Repeat it, yeah. So if there is a single metrics of impact, what is it across you know, most, if not all, investments? And so there's no single metrics, actually, that you can deploy. And what we do is a combination of, of uh, quantitative metrics, and I share a couple of them, with qualitative metrics, with stories. And there's a good reason for this, right? Um, because metrics, measurements in and by themselves, they never tell the whole story. And if we were to confuse metrics with the whole story, we would fall into the same trap as the financial analysts fall. And they sincerely believe that the few metrics that they use are the reality on the ground, right? And therefore, and, but the, the reverse, the corollary is true too. If you just tell stories, it's really not, not not good enough, you know, on, on many levels to be able to satisfy your legi legitimate need of comparing things, right? And so to give you a sense of what metrics we use, and you can check that out on our website as well, klfelicitasfoundation.org, we have about five metrics across all investments that we, that we do, and that's uh, jobs created, clients served, and three financial metrics because we, and, and what we look at is how the relative um, mix of grants versus subsidized capital versus commercial capital changes over time. Our hypothesis being that if you actually move away from grants and get more commercial capital, that that will be a leading indicator of more impact. And so we do believe that financial metrics serve, uh, 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 um, serve a good purpose on that level. And then on the, on the different verticals, we augment that with three or four vertical-specific metrics. Verticals meaning 
Is it health? Is it uh, education? Is it water? And so we have very specific ones. There's emerging standards coming out. Uh, the terminology is called IRIS, I-R-I-S, and it defines the meaning of the metric itself. It's, it's just the terminology. So if you say I created 10,000 jobs, you mean full-time jobs around the year, not half-time or seasonal or whatever, right? You see, then you can actually compare. And there's peers ratings coming up where, um, where there's um, companies that actually rate social enterprises and funds according to different criteria uh, that are environmental, social, and gov governmental. So we can dive into that more if, if there's more questions around that. Yeah, back there. Your, uh, your money you invested, you tried to bring people together in the circle with you. So on, on, on the on, on the pension fund side. Yes, for Where instance. So so the question is really and particularly for the for the big uh, what's called institutional capital, which is which is the big banks and the and the and the pension funds, how do we influence them and you know, influence them to take impact investing not just serious but actually do something, right? Uh, if I can paraphrase. And uh, so so I told you one strategy that we deploy, right? And that, that will take a few years and they, it, it will provide one big data point because what, what the fiduciaries of the pension funds say right now, particularly in, in the US, is that we take more risk and they are not allowed to take more risk in order to deliver the returns. And if you understand the pressures on the pension funds to deliver seven and a half percent, you know, or 8% return, which is almost impossible over the last five years, certainly, you know, in order to make it work, uh, you can see that that argument actually, you know, as, as long as we cannot counter that argument with real numbers, will be hard to overcome. Yet, at the same time, uh, you know, I think uh, there's an argument to be made um, that pension funds and, and big institutional capital should carve out um, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars that we could deploy into impact right now such that they can actually co-develop the products that they need ultimately. You know, they have, they have, they have also a big issue of, they have, they, they're so wealthy that they need to deploy, you know, billions of dollars actually, right? And if, if, they, if they were to deploy that, we would not have the products today uh, to actually digest that amount of money, right? Because there's not that many positive investments that, that you can do. You can do... Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so that that means that we also need to develop that uh, whole uh, supply and demand side in, in parallel, right? Which we need to do. And and lastly, you know, I think um, we need to reevaluate the, um, the the current uh, the current assumptions behind risk. And so I shared with you, right, that long term it seems to be a no-brainer that if you align your long-term investment strategy with holistic sustainability, that you would be rewarded long-term with a lot of financial benefit because it will have to happen, right? I mean, since it will have to happen, the question is when and how and, and how fast and how long and how much disruption will it have, uh, will, will there be until we get there? And those are difficult questions, right? And most, most financial managers then say, well, you know, I, I don't really want to deal with this, and I continue on the path that's not sustainable, just not seeing it, even so everybody can see it if you want to. And that's, that's hard to overcome, right? Because unless you regulate them uh, from the top down, um, which uh, they, they will resist, because they will say, okay, if you regulate me, uh, then I cannot guarantee you, uh, and you, you will have to refinance me with, with public money, right? Uh, which is going on all over all over the world a little bit, right? If the, the, the pension funds are not capitalized correctly to actually deal with the, uh, with the requirements. So there's no easy answer to your question. It's multi-pronged. And I think we need to work on all of them in parallel, just like any systemic change requires that. Back, back there and then in front, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I see him saying he only uses uh, his friends and haircuts to make investments, 
mm-hmm. made me wonder whether if you're in here and like you have a disability or mm-hmm. you're in a different mm-hmm. way of life. Mm-hmm. So additionality, the additionality argument goes something like this, that um, you should, hardcore or whatever, real, real impact investors, you know, uh, should only consider their investments an impact investment if other capital would not flow into these investments anyway. In other words, if you invest in it, it's additional to other capital that otherwise would not flow, right? And uh, it's an academic argument that is academic at best, in my opinion. And uh, it's written by an academic, actually, um, and uh, and it's practiced uh, and was put forward by somebody who was actually the leader of one of the biggest foundations in this valley. And at the time that uh, that he was heading this up, uh, you know, he actually did not believe in impact investing. And it's good to have converts. I think it's about time to have converts. And so um, I applaud him for uh, doing this. But uh, writing articles that then need more articles uh, to be written in order to satisfy a, you know, a career that depends on writing articles is actually not that productive for the, for the overall field. If you believe in my assertion that, um, that we ultimately want to get rid of impact and have investing, impact investing be the norm, then additionality actually doesn't make sense. And I'm happy if, if more people move in and not just us anymore. That's actually the objective, right? In that sense, then we would uh, we would we would replace you know merchant banks with impact merchant banks, investment banks with impact in investment banks, and the and, and the new ecosystem would feast on the carcass of the dying ecosystem that's uh, you know that that that, that is going to be uh, have has to die. And so, in that sense, if you believe in that uh, vision as opposed to a carve out, if you if you believe in an eternal carve out where there's always a carve out that needs to prove the additionality, then the argument is correct. Ah, here. Um, you talked about integrity and just uh, one of your values being living a life that's aligned with your purpose. Um, how did you think about that in terms of your you know, current purposes and what you want to do? Um, uh, you know, what were your values that you were trying to present in that way? Um, what mission do you want to see that you live? Yeah, so, so the question was, you know, when, when you think and reflect on integrity uh, with respect to your consciousness in your life, you know, how, how did that develop a little bit in my career and was that really pronounced earlier on? And if so, how much, right? Um, and uh, I would say that it was uh, dormant and semi-pronounced. Um, so when I reflect, you know, when, when I reflect on the way, you know, that I looked at uh, businesses, technology businesses mostly, right, then, then from my perspective, I always had a what's called now a multi-stakeholder view, not just a shareholder view. Yet I was also an officer of a publicly held company, Ariva, right? And and so um, the uh, lawyers actually tell you that uh, they don't say black and white that you have to always maximize shareholder value, but it has to you know you have to prove potentially uh, that you're not not maximizing shareholder value, and that's how the liability system uh, works in, in a publicly held company here. And, um, and uh, so, so in that sense, if you are an officer of a publicly held company, sometimes you don't get a choice, you know, with respect to the, uh, the choices, that, the business choices that, that you do uh, because of that, uh, be- because of that um, legal uh, issue. There's new incorporation models now uh, that, that, they co- that, that soften that where you actually have to like a B Corp, if you incorporate as a B Corp or an L3C uh, corporation, then in this new way of incorporation, actually the mission is baked into the company's goals and you need to report on that. So if you, if you create a company like this, then, then you avoid that uh, public held company issue. Uh, you know, when I reflect on, on, on our own wealth, um, then I'm actually quite happy or glad or that I didn't make it in oil. I'm, I, I'm never was drawn to, to go into oil or something extractive for some other, you know, industry that actually is clear that it doesn't have a positive impact. Technology, you know, you can really make the argument that uh, an operating system can be used for good or for bad, right? And, and it's not your choice. I mean, is, is that whitewashing or not? You know, I mean, you, we all have to live with, our, with the consequences of our choices, right? And, and uh, at that point in time, I think I was motivated mostly in, 
in becoming the uh, VP of an A-level company that's, that's supported you know, by the top VCs in the Valley, which, uh, which, which was good and which I did. And, um, and uh, yes, I did a lot of reflection already at that point in time. And, but my uh, meditation and yoga practice actually developed after I quit as an executive. <laughs> Where the you know the model of the Lion King investing it was the goal of, of turning you know taking the impact out of the way and just making it that's the investment of the of the world. Yeah. With the the current VC model where they you, you mm -hmm. VCs in general have a terrible return profile because you're you do have to invest in ten or twenty. <clears throat> Most of them are gonna be yeah. does and you hope that one of them is gonna be you. Yeah. So I mean yeah. there's I mean, there's something that how do you, how do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah. So, so the, venture the venture model, which has been incubated here in, in the Valley and has been working for the last 45 years, right, is a very specific model. And it only works for that model, namely if one out of 100 or whatever, you know, has a 100x or 1,000x return. And uh, in impact investing, that model does not work. And, and the reason for that is that the value that these enterprises create is never valued at that extreme level, right? Um, and therefore, uh, you need to have a different portfolio theory of how to, how to invest. And our, our portfolio theory is actually, you know, on that level that, that if we get two to five X return on, on half of the companies as opposed to thousands on one, right? Uh, that would actually um, keep us whole over the long term, um, and that's how we manage. That's more, that's more, more um, appropriate for social enterprises as well. We're also reinventing the um, the term sheets because the term sheets right now are written mostly by venture capitalists. And so, if if a company, so for those of you, I just go two minutes or three minutes in that for those of you who understand term sheets. I know not everybody does. Um, uh, but for companies, right, that provide a service, a social service, and they can monetize that and they have cash flow in the future, we sometimes tap into that cash flow as opposed to an exit strategy, right, where you sell the shares or you go public or you're bought out. And then we can bracket the returns based on the revenue or the profit sharing that we do. And I've just done a deal in India that's structured that way. And some of us even tap the potential return. I tap this one at 15% which is not that much in India. Here it would be quite, quite a lot, but in Indian currency, you know, it's just the low end of commercial capitalism. So, so, so we, 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 we right size, this, size it um, into this. There is a new type of investment called social impact bonds, which our um, foundation was the first foundation in the US to, in, to in, in invest in in the UK, which explicitly ties, ties the financial return to social impact, explicitly. The way that it works in this particular instance is um, for the recidivism rates of male offenders in a county in the UK. And I think roughly about 40% of young male prisoners, when they are released from prison, end up in prison again within 12 months. And McKinsey did a study of how much that costs the society, just the, the, the primary you know, lack of you know, in incarceration first and lack of productivity, not even all the other side effects because they are diff more difficult to, to quantify. And so, um, and, then the, and then a brilliant friend of ours, Arthur Wood, so he put together this structure where on one, uh, it's a three-way structure. One is us impact investors, we give the money to, to a coordinator. That coordinator then actually works with usually not for profits, but also for profits to do the services that the people who are released from prison need like drug treatments, like job training, like you know, re, re, rehabilitation of uh, one form or another. So they get a predictable money stream from us and the government on, on, on the third uh, side. And if we, in this instance, if we actually um, clear a hurdle rate of 7.5% uh, you know, less incarceration, then I get my money back. Otherwise I lose it, which I don't like, <laughs> but you know, we, we restructure that later. But also, if we actually have that, then I get up to 13% in real returns. So you see that actually these are the first ways of developing um, finance, financial products that explicitly tie 
the financial return, the social impact that we have. This principle is actually re-implemented in, in, in New York, for instance, with uh, Goldman Sachs and homeless people. Because homeless people, you know, now that you, if, you, if you know, well, you know that homeless people, when they need health services, they go to, uh, to emergency care, right? And, and you know how, many, how much services they use and you know how much it costs, right? And so they figured that in order, they, they, they could actually save money if they provided, you know, um, um, preemptive, uh, sort of preventative uh, care to the homeless, if they can just figure out how to house them and, and all of that. So it's not that, that straightforward, but I think people are really working on, on correlating that type of social impact with, um, with, with financial return. The, just one, one second. So, so on, the, on the sustainability side, on, on the green side, right, you can actually make a lot of money if you know which externalities become internalities in the market, right? Because, the, you know, I mean, we, we invested in carbon offsets at the, at the time of the first Obama administration, and so did a lot of other people, but they did it because they thought that Obama would change, you know, the uh, carbon offset rules, and he didn't. So, so that money moved out again. We still support it uh, because we're impact investors, not timing the market, right? But if he had timed the market and he actually would have implemented it, he could have made a lot of money on that one. On the social side, the, 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 the mark, the, you know, the markets don't yet have an appreciation that unless we also solve the big social injustices in this world, that the planet will not be a very happy planet. That's, the, that's not understood by the financial markets yet. And so we need to subsidize that level of uh, investment and not expect uh, competitive financial returns on that part of the portfolio. Okay, back there. So who are some of the thought leaders in this space? And I just mentioned Arthur Wood, who is a, a brilliant uh, thought leader. Um, so the, 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 the website that's one of the most um, insightful about capitalism and how it needs to be fixed is Capital Institute, one word, dot org. Capital Institute, dot org. And it's managed by a friend of ours, John Fullerton, who worked for JP Morgan for until 2002. And then he quit, uh, had a midlife crisis, and in 2007, 8, he re-emerged uh, with this new mission in life, uh, and that's uh, changing capitalism. And his blogs and his, um, his insights and his uh, write-ups are really, really inspiring. And so who else would be in that, in that camp? Uh, RSF Social Finance, one word, RS, RSF, stands for Rudolf Steiner Foundation. And... Uh, so so they are really they are here in 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 in, in San Francisco, um, and impact assets one word. I'm on the board of it and I chair the uh, investment committee for donor advised funds. We're bringing out you know two products next year, twenty five thousand dollars to invest in fully diversified portfolio of sustainable agriculture, which is a big topic right globally, and uh, another one for so so it's one step further into democratization because right now. In order to get a fully, fully diversified portfolio, you would have to invest in six or seven efforts. In each one, you would have to invest, you know, to 50,000. Uh, who can do that? Only big, uh, big portfolios can do that. So we put that to 25,000. And then, then, the, then the investment managers uh, of Schwab and Merrill Lynch can actually, you know, uh, recommend this for affluent uh, in, in investors. One way, so soon we're down to the 1,000 level. Who else would be a thought leaders? Um, Leslie Christensen, uh, portfolio theory, modern portfolio theory change, and um, and uh, sent me an email and I can point you to. And, and our our foundation, Caleb Lisa's foundation, has a bunch of uh, pointers in the end there. And then sent me an email if you get stuck. Yeah, here we go.
So um, exits are what, what's, what's referred to as um, liquidity for investors where they get uh, their money together with, uh, with, with profits, right? And exits in the venture community, which only does uh, equity, is, is uh, one of three things, either going public, which Ariba did, or being bought by somebody uh, that, that pays for it then partially in cash, or to do a management buyout, right? Uh, so those are the three exits in a, in, 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 a, in, a, in a pure equity type of environment. And social enterprises usually don't have the first one. So it's very difficult to, to go public, right? Because normally, you know, uh, you would not find the institutional capital to invest in that for underwriters. Or, so, so that's usually not, not an option. Not always, but most of the time it's not. Um, the second is an option, and namely, but it comes with a big risk. So think about, let's say, eHealth Point, right? That's in the in the health ins health and insurance industry, and um, and uh, I put together, you know, a round of six hundred thousand dollar investments with Tonic Friends, and it was it was structured as a as an impact deal, meaning we own it's a convertible note with two percent only. So so really really. You know, very very favorable to the to the investee, not the investor. Yet, if it actually, you know, if it if if it actually converts, then you would be part of the upside later. And now it's on the verge of converting because I'm raising two to four million in equity. And if we do that, then it would convert and would then be uh, part of the up up round. So you see that that's a partial exit, but not a full exit. And yet, that is very different than which I also had putting on knocking on my door is um, big um, hospital chains and insurance companies who wanted to invest and become the majority investor. And if you allow that, then you could have what's called mission, mission loss, right? And, and so if, if you allow a non-aligned investor to actually buy you out, uh, then that might kill the mission. And that's a big debate in the impact investing scenario. We're working on, on, on putting together uh, impact holding companies, for instance, right? Uh, but they need to be capitalized with, uh, you know, almost like a billion dollars if you want to be able to buy out significant chunks of, uh, of, 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 of ownership, um, and that's not there yet. Um, so, so for social entrepreneurs who want to retire legitimately, right, if they're getting older, there's not that many options for them, you know, without losing their, their life's mission. And so those are ideas uh, to have more exits along the conventional route. Now, what we also do, so, so that's really buyouts or management, partially management buy, buybacks also do occur, but not, you know, the big ones financed by the banks, more sort of, uh, you know, sm smaller ones. What, 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 what does occur, of course, is, met, you know, mezzanine funding, and if you do have cash flow, uh, that you tap into the cash flow. So it's not, it's a, it's a quasi-equity deal or a quasi-debt deal, which we do quite a bit of uh, that. So for those of you who are interested in that, maybe over pizza, because, because I'm losing like 80% of you right now. <laughs> so we can talk about that later, but that's a good, yeah. Yeah. I'm only really curious about um, sort of the transparency of your business, because yeah. you're looking essentially at being an expensive private money deal. Yeah. And it's not like you're trying to make the investment in the scale. You're yeah. trying to invest in the say, a small little water system or something like yeah. that. Small yeah. 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 So, so, so due diligence and, and transparency and transaction costs and, and cost of due diligence is a very big topic. And that's, I think, the magic of Tonic is that we can, so all the Tonic investors, they're usually, they have a big, a big knowledge, deep knowledge in one of the areas that they work in. And so, so for instance, I, I've worked in India quite a bit. And so I have partners on the ground in India whom I trust. And therefore, if you want to invest in India, you say, hey, Charlie, what investments do you have? I trust you. Maybe do one deal first with us, right? And ultimately, then you don't have to do the same due diligence if you trust my due diligence, right? That, that, that's how that works. And that's what I meant by radical transparency and sharing of due diligence, which is not the natural way of how, how, this, how, 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 how these funds work. Yet we, we don't work with anybody who doesn't sign up for that. And then suddenly, you know, the tonic... <coughs> Tonic members have to pay five thousand dollars per year, you know, to support us. We're a for-profit LLC uh, because we don't want to have transaction. We don't want to cut any deals. We want to just be member member related, so so that there's no conflict of interest, right? 
And uh, but if you if you if you think about five thousand dollars and doing due diligence, you're you know and having you know forty fifty deals vetted for you that otherwise would cost you you know thirty thousand dollars to do the due diligence yourself. You know, it's actually a good deal for 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 these tonic countries. And we need to we need to understand more how to aggregate and how to share and how to how, how to do that. Otherwise, you know, scalability will will be really 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 hard. Yeah. So the question is really bottlenecks, uh, particularly on the product side. And so let me just uh, share a little bit of more light on that. Um, and um, so one product is social enterprise that you want to invest in, a single enterprise, right, that you want to seed stage or a startup stage or growth stage. And so um, so the question is, is there scarcity of supply or demand on that point in that particular you know product slice and uh, with respect to seed stage I think it's really investable um, enterprises so if we have more robust investable enterprises since the, the ticket size is fairly small there would be enough capital to actually go in and that's where the incubators and accelerators play a huge role the more we, we do that which are subsidized the more investable entities, you know, enterprises come out, and that will alleviate partially alleviate that particular scarcity. As you move up the chain, and you actually get to private equity deals, which for institutional capital is you know ten million dollars and upwards, uh, there's actually not enough deals out there. Uh, I mean, so, sorry, not not in, both. It's both both things. Uh, so um, we don't we have not really developed these bigger deals yet. Uh, I mean, the tonic deals are getting to the Told you four million, five million, maybe close to ten million. Some of them, but just some of them get, getting to that point, right? And um, once we have critical mass on that one, uh, critical mass being, you know, what, what does that mean, right? If you have really a lot of private clientele from the big banks are asking for these deals and they want to be, um, they want to access that. Uh, I wonder if the if 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 the money will move if we have these deals. You know, I'm skeptical, but we'll see. Now. On the product side, uh, the, the there's there's issues in certain asset classes where there's just not that many impactful deals out there. In alternative assets, hedge funds, we are invested in in only two hedge funds uh, because we cannot find uh, too many that are aligned. One of them, I think it's called AWS. You can look up our investments on our website. It's fully transparent, and it's it's a great hedge fund. It's long long short only long short, which means that they short certain companies and go long on, on, on others and they short unsustainable companies which is great because I'm, I love to make money when they go under you know <laughs> because I believe that that's the right strategy so it's very much aligned in alignment with our mission right and they go long on sustainable ones so perfect I, I wish we had more you know hedge funds like this that actually take the themes of impact investing and play them out and the other the other one where where we don't have as much deal flow products is actually in, in real assets. I talked a little bit about the extractive technology and timber and, uh, and, and carbon offsets and biodiversity. So there's not yet um, you know, many, many opportunities for big capital to come in. And so, so helping to, to, to and, and sometimes it might require you know, that we would actually incubate an industry where we are willingly taking a hit. So it's, it's a legitimate argument. If you become um, an extractive CEO, right? And say that that's really what you want to do, and you want to do it green, you will probably not be able to make a business. And because all your competitors, it's a legitimate argument, right? They don't have to clean up, and therefore it's not on their balance sheet to clean up. And they pay their miners got awful salaries. So if you pay them better, you will probably produce gold much, much more, you know, with a much bigger cost structure. So we would be willing with our friends to temporarily, in that instance, maybe enable you to do your business and expecting temporarily lower returns in order to make you the new industry, right? And that's when critical mass is necessary because, believe it or not, you know, $50 million to invest is nothing in order to change the industry there. You need really billions of dollars to do that. And, and we're, we're working on that. 
but it's, uh, it's I don't know if we're going to be on time, frankly. But I mean, I mean Tara Sands is not to get capitalized, period. No? I, mean, I don't know why pension fund, but I know because they get a lot of money and they get a lot of return for it. And so if you go and tell, tell your pension fund, if you have one, right, which most of you don't, but if you had one, <laughs> then, then you should ask them, you know, are, are you, what are you investing in? And if you see that, you should challenge them, right, and say, hey, you know, why do you miss, you know, our son, uh, see, he works for Apple now because the company that he worked for was bought up by Apple. But the 401, you know, he says, I want the 401k. When I go, when I go in retirement in 30 years, I don't want to invest in, in, in the companies that actually mess up the future of my life on the planet. It's a legitimate, you know, argument, right? Yet he doesn't have a choice. Yet, you know. And so, 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 but when you ask them, the pension fund uh, managers, they say, uh, you say, oh, please don't mess up the, the life of, uh, you know, the environment for my kids and grandkids. They say, oh, you don't understand risk. They say, okay, sorry. And they go back. <laughs> and yet, if you ask them, then it's a, you show me your returns 2008, 2009. I bet you that they were much worse than mine. Yeah. And so that we need to call, you know, we need to call the industry on the carpet on that one. We all need to do that, even if we don't have a lot of assets. Yeah. So, well, no, we still have five minutes. Yeah. Actually, I was reading this article today about the Indian company. I can't remember the name and how the thing came up. And it was what they did was adding very few terminals to the company to make them more efficient. Mm -hmm. And your presentation was also about the funds that they need to run. So, if you're being charged with for the fund funds, you know, I can't remember exactly what they were doing. So, what was the read on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, so, so the question is, impactful leaders, do they need or should they have some experience in, in all three sectors, that being, you know, private sector, not-for-profit sector, and governmental sector? Um, and the answer is, if you can, it's really great. It would be, so, so what happens is that there's a lot of finger pointing, a lot of, you know, prejudices on all sides. And the, you know, the pure philanthropists, in my cookbook, uh, you know, are as bad as the pure capitalists and the pure communists because they usually define their success at the expense of everybody else, right? Hello, you know, that doesn't work anymore. We need to collaborate. And so blended capital, having some experience about the terminology that, that they use. And we talked, I think, beforehand about, you know, hiring only eight players. Uh, it was on one of my slides too. The not-for-profit sector doesn't believe that. They believe if you just hire... <laughs> hire people who want to do good, that they can have a lot of impact, which is clearly wrong. Uh, but still, they believe that, right? And I, it, it's just, it's, it, 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 it's really surprising to me. And, and I cannot still, with all my meditation, cannot handle that level of incompetence. And, and I have to work on myself, you know, <laughs> do not be, become impatient in that, uh, in, in these circumstances. Yet, you know, they have, they do have an understanding of, um, they have a compassionate understanding of, of the things that we want to accomplish, you know, with people that, that, that we sometimes in the for-profit sector don't have that, right? And we can learn. So in, in India, in the incubator in India, I combined for-profits and not-for-profits about half-half, and magic happens because the not-for-profit folks, they learn from the for-profit folks and vice versa, right? With the government, you know, God, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, if, 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 if at any point in time I would need 51% of, of, of consensus out there of what I did, I would not have done anything probably. And so I, I have no, I cannot really work with government myself because of that reason. And I really applaud everybody who does and they are very necessary and very important. I think it's very, very broken. I don't have a better solution. It's awful what's going on right now. Uh, and uh, somebody needs to tackle it, I cannot. Yeah. Maybe one more or two more and then we leave it, yeah. So 
So our, our way of structure is we have a foundation that we're totally transparent about, and that's about 10 million, give or take um, a few. And then the people who know us know that we have about uh, 50 million, five zero million of investable assets. And so we just say we use the same strategies, but we're not as transparent for privacy reasons. And, um, and so, but then, then we make the claim that our approach would scale an order of magnitude down and up. And that's where the 5 million to 500 million uh, come in. And I didn't really quite understand where you want to go with private equity or non, yeah. Just, so and transparency or maybe, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Outside the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Can't tell what the tonic is working. Oh, tonic. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so tonic is a separate thing. It's a you know we co-founded that and we are we are part of tonic, but it's really not in it, it's a membership organization, meaning that the members do all the work. Uh, tonic is not regulated. Is it's not SEC. It doesn't have a broker dealer license, so we don't make recommendations of investments. Our members do that, right? And so we're really it's member member. And, um, and then similar, the 100% Impact Network is also a membership-based organization uh, that we participate in and are co-creators um, of, but not really, and, 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 and the members really do the investments. It's not, there's no co-investment facility. They do the investments. So you're building from scratch without any relationships? Yeah. 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 And there's an opportunity, you know, maybe to do a co-investment facility, maybe downstream. If we have um, deal flow that, uh, that that is interesting to these commercial investors, he's gone now. Um, you know, so you say, oh, if you want to co-invest now, then we de-risk your future investment by you getting to know the deals, and and that's that's also going on. Okay, last question, and then we'll, we'll leave it. Yeah, last question, if there is one. Oh. But we're done. <laughs> Thank you.